All right. Um, you have heard most about the technology, uh, and therefore, I'm talking about the results today, not, not the technology. And what I'm presenting basically are results of LIDAR for archaeology. Uh, we, you heard about the, the, the properties of photography. One of the properties of photography, of course, is that is, is, is uh, not an active, but is a passive sensor. It needs energy to acquire images. LiDAR has a difference, uh, uh, is an active sensor, therefore you can use it 24 hours a day. You could fly LiDAR at night, for example, you have exactly the same results, assuming that the weather is conducive for LiDAR that you get during the day. Um, I, I use a, 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 a tool to uh, visualize LiDAR and photography and compare them, which I call slider. Uh, and this is what you're seeing over there. Uh, on the top, it is a photo. In reality, it's what you call a digital orthophoto, which means thousands or hundreds of photos can be seen together to form an even uh, uh, set depicting what the, the camera can see. The difference between the photo and the LiDAR, as Ken said, is the ability to see below the tree canopy. Now, here on top is the, is the, the orthophoto. If I remove the orthophoto, that what is lying be underneath the tree canopy. And that's the difference for archaeology, basically. Um, the, uh, under the tree canopy, you can see, of course, the, 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 you can see roads, the divisions of the blocks that were built in a thousand years ago, or, or, or even, even uh, earlier than that, temples that are, in, you cannot fully see if you fly in the air, right? So look at the temple disappearing. Of course the barai is there, but the shape of the barai is not complete. And so on and so forth. The, the, these marks on the ground has been described as ruins from, from houses that uh, were populated in that, in that area. Uh, the houses were made of wood, of course, throughout time that would disappear, but the foundation stayed and what you see is the foundations. So that is the end. I'm, now I'm going back to the, to the beginning and uh, uh, talking about how do we do LiDAR. Uh, if you allow me a second. There you go. Yes? All right. So, um, how do we do LiDAR? Uh, well, we do LiDAR differently for each application, each, each accuracy, each definition we need to do. For example, uh, for a, a, an engineering pro program uh, uh, that, that uh, has, requires a road or, or uh, a port or a railway and so on, we may need only eight or four points per square meter. When it comes to LiDAR, we have to expand that to the maximum possible to be able to depict small relative differences on the ground. And that's what we do. Uh, we use helicopters to, do, to acquire LiDAR for archaeology for the simple reason that helicopters fly slow and we can fly terrain with helicopter and not, not that easy to fly with a fixed wing. Uh, and uh, the helicopter, be because it flies slower and lower, you can acquire more points, average per square meter, or real points per square meter. While LiDAR, because it's higher accuracy, is, is, is fast to acquire, um, it, it does not require ground control points or a well, that's not true. It, it requires <laughs> ground control point, but not as many points as for the photography. We, one point per, per 40 kilometer radius is enough. 
is accurate, uh, 7 centimeters to 30 centimeters, depending on the tree cover and the surface. Uh, require the scan sun now uh, and millions of points per, per, per minute. Um, in Southeast Asia or tropical weathers, we can cover approximately uh, 3,000 hectares per hour. In, uh, in a blue sky is what means no cloud, we can cover easily 5,000 hectares an hour. Uh, Post-processing has all the advantage that any data, airborne data has, DTMs, profiles, uh, rectification of, of air photo, volume calculations, and so on. Uh, those are the applications. As you can see, they are varied, and archaeology figures into that. I'm not going to develop any of those in particular. Um, that's what the LIDAR system looks like. We have a, uh, an LS70 high pulse, uh, is manufactured by Leica. Um, there's basically uh, uh, only a few manufacturers of high, high caliber LIDAR systems in the world, Leica is one of them. And a, a company, or together with the, with the LIDAR, we install and use a, cam a camera is a medium format camera, is an RCD30, and we can acquire um, photos along with, with a lot of our system. We process those, we rectify those, and deliver part of the, of the, the product that to, to our clients. The first image that I show you, where I slided uh, the, the, the photo out from under, under the light, uh, over the LiDAR, that was acquired when, with such camera. So uh, to acquire LiDAR, you need, of course, as I said, one base station for a 4 kilometer radius. And this is basically what it looks like. Um, we have one base station. It's connected to, to the, to the, is connected to the, to the satellites. And of course, satellites connect to the, to the, the GPS on board. Uh, so, on board of the aircraft, in this case the helicopter, this is the helicopter that we use, by the way, in, in Cambodia for 2012-2015 as uh, a GPS, an IMU, and that is what m helps us or makes the, the LiDAR very accurate with those factors. We use surveying points. Uh, but those are for calibration and to test the data. That's what we do. So uh, to start a project, of course, is a flight plan. The flight plan varies what with the application, and most important varies with the terrain. If it is mountains terrain, it's a complex flight plan. If it is not, like in this one here, is a flat area. Uh, basically, is is uh, uh, straightforward. And this is the accuracy. I mean, we talk about the accuracy of LiDAR. Well, this, of course, uh oh. There you go. No. All right, I leave my hand there then. So these are the accuracy of the LiDAR, as you can see over here. That's what we, we can do. That's what the LiDAR can do. So the RMS is over here, right? So <laughs> as you can see, it's incredibly accurate. Uh, so what to measure? What to measure depends on application. See, is the top, the first, last return, extra runs, I mean, because of the complexity of the terrain. Uh, wide beam, narrow, and so on and so forth. That, the, 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 the application must, I may need some help here. There you go. So, uh, can mention the, the pulse, and these are the returns. So one, one pulse, you can have all the returns that are depicted here even more. 
and that helps to define not only the surface but also the terrain. So, um, when you acquire data, these are the, what we call the SWATs or the, the width of the run of the LiDAR. We put all those together and then have an homo homogeneous data set for the area that we want to survey with LiDAR. There you go. That's how it works. And that's the SWAT. So uh, when you receive the data is all in, in one mass, uh, 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 and we process that, uh, run some algorithms that can define what is the ground and that it is non-ground. And that's basically the first classification. The non-ground can be classified then in other uh, uh, categories. So for example, buildings, infra other infrastructure, vegetation, high, low vegetation, and so on and so forth. Point density is important. It's important to define what we need to define. And for example, in archaeology, we're looking at centimeter differences that will allow archaeologists yourselves to say, this is man-made or as a, as a potential of being man-made. And that's what we're trying to pick. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry you cannot see really what is uh, showing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the screen like, like I can see it. But what I wanted to point out this is the analysis of this area, and there's the point density that we have for this project. So what we can deliver? Well, you have a standard delivers that most clients want, or all the clients want, and have value added that we provide to other clients that have other, uh, other needs on, on their project development. So um, here are the, some of the applications that LiDAR covers very well, right? And um, including, for example, flood, mon flood monitoring modeling. You imagine that uh, 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 what will happen if a flood exists in Ayutthaya, for example, or Siem Reap, uh, and uh, in a very flat, low, low areas, low ground areas. So that's what we can do with LiDAR. You can model to say if is a flood, what happens if the water rises by half a meter, what about one meter? Until we can see that the city is inundated and all, all disappears. We can do perspectives. We can provide clients a perspective, for example, in infrastructure. that say this is an ancient road that cross the mountains somewhere in Southeast Asia. Well, we can do the profiling, you can do that. So, you are in this, of course, in what it is uh, uh, archaeology. So, this is the view of archaeology. Now, uh, I showed b before that was a, a, a pointing out to east, and uh, this is a profile of looking east, right? And this is Angkor Wat. Now, Angkor has been depicted by millions of points. You can see the towers, the main tower, and the, and the lateral towers. So we do the same thing looking west. You can have another aspect of Angkor Wat. You could do this, this for all the point carnival kind of points, and you can do a 360 degree if you wanted to. There you go. Each one, different aspects, points of view. This is what I uh, can already describe. This is a perspective, uh, uh, sorry, an intensity. Intensity is a grayscale. This one is a grayscale. And is a perspective view looking from a particular point of view, obviously. Uh, we can do the same thing in color. In this case, is uh, color to elevation. So the highest 
will be red uh, and then yellow, green, and the, the lowest on this image will be the blue. Um, again, that's an example, that's a, a, a mosaic of orthophotos taken. And uh, if I look in under the ground, this is the LiDAR. Now, over here you have trees, but over here we have a temple area. This is Kulen. And Kulen in 2012, uh, this is 2012 work done in Kulen, and it was discovered that Kulen is, is important for, for uh, Cambodia and the Khmer civilization, revealing uh, pre-Ancorian pre uh, sites that are, are very important. Um, the, the, um, the data on the right, sorry, the data on the right is waveform, by the way, that uh, Ken mentioned before. Uh, we acquired waveform, we can digitize it and enhance the, the, the terrain definition by the waveform. The same thing, you have Angkor Wat, so the, you have the, the ortho, right? And if I lift it underneath is, a, is the LiDAR result, are the LiDAR results. Another area is, is the, 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 the dark area here uh, uh, is really a shadow of, a shadow of uh, um, cloud. But if we remove the LiDAR, uh, sorry, you remove the orthophoto, you have the LiDAR underneath. This is the grayscale, and this is that, that same grayscale but colored. Uh, it is important to notice sometimes the coloring of that grayscale brings out detail that has not been detected or is not detected by the, the, the grayscale. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> For me or Ken? Which one? I'll tell you what, I'll start with you. <laughs> I have two questions. First, after scanning if I need all the data, I have to screen some point count out. Such as uh, the 300 feet. Yes. Um, how can I validate the accuracy of the terrain model that was generated by the interpolation? Perfect. Perfect. The next is uh, I want to know which interpolation method that you use for this. Uh, the different method will give a different result and perfect to the interpolation. interpolation. Effect to the well, we, you asking me if I if I understand you asking how to validate validate the data as, as I think I said before we have the system is calibrated when it is is installed after installation the system is calibrated to ground control ground ground survey points so we know. Uh, uh, in X and Y, when we fly cross lines, we know that is th there is no di discrepancy, but also can compare the ground points to the to, to the survey points from the lidar to ground. So that validates that. On top of that, we have what we call test point areas. Test point areas are acquired on hard surfaces. Uh, and, uh, um, for example, roads or parking lots or any, anywhere the LiDAR can, can see, so to speak. And uh, those are compared to the LiDAR. And so, after the LiDAR is adjusted to the terrain, these are compared and either they fit the requirement or if they don't fit, we have to go back to the calibration point and redo the process. But it, it is not an issue. Uh, uh, 
as, assuming of course the LiDAR is working well and if like the, the job of course is working well <laughs> so uh, uh, the results will always will be there to what the client requires Uh, I don't understand the interpolation. There is no interpolation on the points. No. The, the points, what you see, that's what we get. Uh, you know, it is not one point here, one point there, and you interpolate in between. No, no, no such thing. Uh, in reality, so many points that at times clients ask to resample, meaning reducing the number of points. Um, what is interpolation? Will be interpolation is if we deliver counters, for example then therefore is an interpolation from the points to the contents. Contents is a second generation and not as accurate as the points by definition. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Can you? Well, that was quite impressive. Uh, two questions. The assemblage of equipment in the Leica, the 60 megapixels camera, the inertial adjustment gizmo, the, uh, uh, the data logger, um, how much does that turn cost? <laughs> uh, too much. <laughs> <laughs well, uh, if you're starting from scratch, uh, meaning you, you're going to buy the system, the camera, and everything else, software, and so on and so forth, additional hardware, accessories, and so on, all around two million dollars. And how much an hour does helicopter time cost? Well, that depends on where, but uh, between 1800 to 2000 3000 dollars an hour, depends where you are in the world. We, we had a, a put a proposal to, deal, to do LiDAR in uh, Machu Picchu uh, and using an helicopter uh, that we can work with and he, he, they were charging $3,100 a day, uh, an hour. And finally, <laughs> Which is um, within the world of archaeology and cultural conservation, um, who are your clients for this, for this uh, level of well, usually, yeah, usually organizations. Uh, um, the the City University was our first client for, together with Apsara uh, and so on, uh, were our first client for the 2012 um, work in, in Angkor Wat. Uh, EFEO, the European Union, and, and other, other organizations were the clients for 2015. I, we did uh, fly in uh, Thailand, we just completed a couple of weeks ago, uh, work for Phnom Rung, Phnom Rung, and that, that was uh, privately, privately funded um, with our partner here in Thailand. So it depends where it comes from. Uh, for Machu Picchu was, uh, uh, again, a combination of different organizations and, uh, um, and uh, providing the funding. Unfortunately, uh, um, has been has been postponed or cancelled. But thanks very much. So I'd just like to add something uh, in defence of the manufacturer. <laughs> uh, what we tend to find is that we have companies such as McElhenney who buy the equipment and they provide it as a service. And of course, the service for you for a certain area and a certain part of the world is going to be a certain price. They take on the capital expenditure, but then, of course, they can use the equipment over five to seven years, something like that. The life cycle of the uh, LiDAR should be around five to seven years, if not longer. So they can spread the investment over the time. So the numbers that he mentioned <laughs> uh, are not necessarily what you, unless you have that type of investment available to you, would, may wish to make. The other thing is I'd like to say is that I've been to a few forestry um, uh, conferences around the world and one of the things that you have to understand is that there's primary data and there's secondary data. So it could be that there is a national organization which pays for the primary data collection of a certain area, but another organization who may not be so well funded or may not be so primary focused on the original capture can then access that information either for a cheaper cost or even for free depending on who captured uh, or who paid for the primary data collection. So it is possible, even though it sounds quite a lot, it is possible to do so with certain government organizations or who are able to, to invest either in buying the equipment or invest in a service provider to give them that equipment, uh, sorry, to give them the data 
but it is also possible in circumstances you may get the data as a secondary source so it may be either much cheaper or free yeah ken is absolutely right and i forgot to mention that uh, in, in reality, doing work for archaeology, we can do, for example, Siem Reap, doing the work for Angkor. Siem Reap has a tendency to flood, right? And has a tendency to, to, to droughts also. So doing water resource work based on LIDAR would make sense. Um, again, the, the, the mention of forestry, of course, we fly LIDAR in areas that are forested. So forestry companies, conservation, uh, parks, and so on can use that data, or should use that data, I should say, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, monitor, develop, maintain, conserve whatever areas that they are, they are supposed to do. Uh, and that should be, could be, shared data and shared cost. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time, but that's definitely the potential is there. The LiDAR that we've been talking about earlier on uh, today is uh, what we would call a topographic LiDAR. So generally speaking, a topographic LiDAR, those uh, examples that you've just seen, will not be able to penetrate uh, water. They will be reflected off and in fact you probably won't get to return because it acts like glass, the laser fires down and instead of going back to the receiver it just goes off into the distance like glass. So that generally happens with lasers. All lasers are basically like that. However, the ones that we were mentioning earlier on, the topographic lasers are red lasers in general, uh, and they operate at a specific part of the, uh, the spectrum. There are, however, and Leica does also offer these um, uh, products, there are what they call bathymetric LIDAR. And there is also, uh, which operate in a green let's say a laser, uh, in a different part of the spectrum. And those can penetrate rivers. Uh, there are several kinds, uh, two main kinds of bathymetric LiDAR. One is the inshore uh, systems, which only penetrate for you know, five, 10 meters. And then there's what we would call the offshore or shelf bathymetric LiDARs that can do maybe up to 79 meters under the ground. Uh, sorry, under the uh, what, sea level. We also have uh, a system called the Chiropta, which actually is a combination of a red topographic LiDAR and a green bathymetric LiDAR. So those are together in one uh, sensor, probably with a camera, a medium format camera, like you were shown earlier. So those ones are generally done for the used for the, the beach foreshore areas or for river courses. So as you fly along a valley, which has got a river in it, the topographic LiDAR picks up what you've seen today and the bathymetric LiDAR can also penetrate uh, the river depending on the turbidity, you know, depending on whether it's clear or dirty water, etc. Uh, and that could give you the result that you're looking for. Depends very much though on the turbidity. They, they use something called the Secchi uh, uh, scale, so it depends on how uh, much particulate is in the water. If it's very clear water, then of course the penetrations deeper. If it's less clear, then there's not so much penetration. But that's a possible uh, solution to what you're mentioning. In addition to that, uh, uh, we have used LiDAR in, uh, um, to fly near Davao. And we use the city for, to calibrate the LiDAR. As I said, we install the LiDAR systems and camera and calibrate them and then we fly the area that we have to fly. When we look at the calibration data, I, I, I frowned because the shoreline didn't look like smooth. It was something like this, right? 
dropped. So we analyzed that and the LiDAR, the red LiDAR had penetrated the water for the, some reason. So it can happen if you are lucky. No, no, we can we can treat this as 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 required. Uh, if you if you want to have a 360 degree view, we could do that. We could do a flight through using the, the, the data from outside the, the the temple Angkor Wat, and you walk it through as you go into the main entrance, and you walk around and so on and so forth. You can. Uh, go up and go down as you see fit, uh, and that's only data processing. That's all. You, you as we walk, you can start seeing uh, parts of the temple showing, <laughs> and the parts of the trees and so on. So it's, it's, it's an image being created at the time on the flight throughs, um, perspective views, anything you want to do. I mean, the, this was a simple profile basically. We take a width and can be as, as wide as you see, as you like, or as you can, and you create a profile, and that happens to be that the, we picked the east, west, north, south, because it was very significant. So, walking back here, I've seen everybody that says, Get it over with. Let's get out of here. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Anyway, I just want to make a few points uh, about this in case it wasn't clear to anyone here because uh, it gets a little confusing. LiDAR doesn't give you the age, so you have to go ground truth it, validate it that way. So what we see is the topography. And if you can pull up that slide and don't cool it, we actually conducted work on the day site, which was in the left hand corner of the NSCV. And then the ADF team is working out there doing good work using LIDAR as well. And then uh, Damien Evans, who I wish were here, is uh, he explained the archaeology and from here. The Oscar guys will probably talk about it uh, in great detail because they use it quite frequently. But uh, one of my concerns is volumetrics. And so you get the width and the height of the surface features. For me, if we had an image up right there, it shows me how much landscape was artificially altered. And so that's very useful. And so there's a lot of questions we can ask archaeologically that instead of just finding sites, we can ask different kinds of questions. How much dirt was moved? And how much labor does that take? Uh, how many uh, labor hours? What kind of workforce do you need to move that much? And then go check these things. So what the point being is I encourage people to explore other than just, hey, look at those geometric shapes, that might be a site, but to use the data to ask other kinds of questions. Thank you. Uh, there is the slide up if you, if you want, uh, Kyle. I don't think we can see it too well, but the rectangular uh, structures up there in the upper left-hand corner of the black and white image, if you can point the laser pointer to that, it, it one. First return and second return. This area? Yeah. 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 So uh, we estimated the volume of that and equated it to how much labor it would take. And so that tells us something about how what, what's needed to organize that kind of workforce, what kind of time. And so there's a whole spectrum of interesting archaeological questions you can ask other than is that a site or is it not? And how old is it? Thank you.